I'm honored today to introduce our speaker uh, for the Pride organization, Shane Crone. Um, and I'm not going to tell you a lot about him because I think you're going to find out quite a bit about him and his um, compelling and very tragic story. Um, but let me, let me just say something about this laboratory. And uh, I think the turnout today demonstrates what I'm going to tell you. I've worked in the nuclear weapons program for 36 years now, first at Los Alamos and for the last 32 years at Livermore. And I've, oh, <laughs> no, the applause goes to those organizations because for, for, for the 36 years that I've been at these organizations, we have respected and supported the LGBT community. And <laughs> yes, Appl applause to them. I mean, some of the leading figures who have, who have designed and sustained the nuclear deterrent of this country are gay. And we have always worried about the fact that they should be supported and enabled to do the work that defends this country. And I find this very moving. So if I seem like I'm quavering a bit, it's because I am. Anyway, so let me just, let me get off the stage here and let Shane tell you about himself and his life. Thank you. Hi there. I think this is, is it on? Can you hear me? Uh, I just wanted to quickly say hi and, and say thank you for being here today and for giving me this opportunity to, to share my story. Uh, we're going to be screening the, a shortened version of the documentary that I made. And so it's, you know, it's kind of interesting because we had to cut it down. So I hope everything still makes sense. Um, but it, it truly is an honor to, to be here and to be a part of your pride activities. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, to talking with you after. And um, I met a lot of you, and I'm looking forward to meeting those that I haven't met yet. Um, but again, just thank you. Thank you so much. And I will see you in about a half hour. <laughs> thank you. Montana is probably not the easiest place to have a child grow up who is gay. Our community is, uh, you don't want to say backwoodsy, but you know, they're, they're rural and so they don't accept people who are different. The day Shane was born, I had to get a special leave from the hospital to go sign my divorce papers. So I was the talk of the hospital because we're a small little town and, and <laughs> that was kind of the, the special moment in my life. I was in elementary school and what I would do sometimes is I didn't want to go to bed. My mom would tell me to go to bed and then I would sneak out and sit behind her recliner and watch the TV. One time she was watching the movie Philadelphia. Finally got to the end of the movie and I, I knew that this guy was gay and I knew that he was sick and he was dying because of being gay. And that really, it struck a chord with me because I knew that I was like him. That guy liked another guy, and look what happened. He kept getting thinner, he kept getting pale, and there was like sores on his face and his body. And I just remember thinking that that's, that's going to be me, that's going to happen to me. He got quieter, and he wasn't as fun to be around. You could tell that something was always on his mind, something was always bothering him, but you never knew what it was. One night, I remember Shane coming into my room, and he said, Mom, I'm dying of AIDS. And I said, Honey, wh why are you saying that? And he goes, Well, because of that movie. And I said, Well, honey, you, ha you don't have AIDS. And that's when I really noticed Shane starting to have panic attacks. He felt like he couldn't breathe. He would, and he would have to say, You've got to put a sack over your head. He didn't like doing it. But when he was at my house, we put a sack over his head. It's kind of funny now that here I was, a little boy, on my knees praying to God that I wouldn't be gay. And there was another little boy 1,500 miles away in Indiana doing the same thing. Knox, Indiana is not the easiest place for a gay kid to grow up. 
It's very homogenous, not much diversity there. I knew Tom when both of our brothers were in Boy Scouts together. Everybody loved him. He was just the popular kid. He had a lot of empathy. I'll never forget the day my mom died, Tom was the first person to come over to my house. He walked in the door and he was, you know, he was crying. You know, I almost thought he's sadder than I am. Tom's dad, he was a simple blue collar worker, came home late, got up really early the next day and, you know, did it again. And both of his parents sacrificed a lot for Tom's happiness. His mom took a job as a janitor so that Tom could go to Culver. Tom just had this presence. He had this energy. He was always singing and laughing and enjoying life so much. There was a decorated general with a heart of gold. He was at the top of his class. He was a leader in all aspects of the of the word and in sports and in school. On the battlefield, he came. Every time you met Tom, it felt like you were meeting your best friend. And it didn't matter who you were, he always had your back. I think Tom went to Culver instead of the high school in his hometown because he saw it as an opportunity to open his horizons. And, you know, his parents played a big role in that. Tom, for as beautiful as he was, and, you know, he did not care at all about how other people look. And he did not care where you came from, which car you drove. He just accepted anybody and everybody for who they were. And I think because he was gay and because he knew what it was like to be not the mainstream normal person, he told me many times how much he respected me because I was hearing a pair. What 20-something year old says to you, wow, you're amazing, you've done so much, I'm in total awe of you. Who, who says that? Nobody. The one thing that I wanted was just someone that I could talk to and relate to that accepted me for being me. There was a, a situation with a couple of friends in high school and, and they were questioning his sexuality and kind of were, you know, mocking him, making fun of him. Kids at school were constantly picking on him. He wasn't accepted anymore. They called him gay, they called him fag. Uh, the names that they called him were just horrendous. Shane was at a football game and all these kids started spitting in this cup. And next thing I know, the one kid that used to be a real good friend of Shane's had this cup and he's just about ready to tip it on Shane's head. And let me tell you, if you want to talk about a mother bear protecting her cub, this woman came unglued. And I said, you put that damn cup down and leave him alone. It was just heartbreaking to see that happen to my son. I just, I went to a really dark place and I had a breakdown. I got a call from the school informing me my son has been in school for two weeks. Other kids made his life literally a living hell. And it never really got better, and I don't think he ever saw it would get better, and that's why he just stopped going. I was sick of the embarrassment and the pain that I was bringing to my family. I felt like the only way that I can make their lives better is by taking my own. I was at my dad's house, I was home alone, and I just walked over to his gun case and I took one of the guns and I just went back in the living room and I just sat there and I held it. I mean, there's so many thoughts like going through my head at that moment. It was like for over an hour, just really contemplating like what my next step should be. Fortunately, I also thought through and that it wouldn't be fair to my family. It wouldn't be fair to my mom. And I just had to visualize what the experience would be like for them if I did take my life and it, it wouldn't be worth it. Well, I'm leaving Kalispell right now and it's roughly three o'clock. And yep, I am nervous. I've been talking to my family and everyone's crying and doing that whole thing. I'm gonna be on my cell phone so it looks like I'm not talking to myself. After graduation, he got a scholarship to go to the school here in town. And so it was hard, hard for me to not have him take it because he wanted to go to California. I knew when he went to Hollywood, he was going to be okay. And he could mix in with where a lot of gay people were. I didn't even know he went. To do. My mind is gone. I can't remember many things. I think he was barely 18 years old. He, this thin 
kid with curly hair out of Montana into the big city. He was very quiet, very reserved. I got a job working as a production assistant for a TV show. Shane and I met in the tape vault, and it was pretty much love at first sight. He's got that small town kind of quality to him. He's just so likable and funny and so humble. Shane doesn't necessarily see sort of what everyone else sees. One of my friends that I worked with, she invited me to go bowling with one of her friends. We had this idea that we had to get Tom and Shane to meet each other, but we didn't tell them that it was a setup. She said that there was going to be this guy there named Tom and that he's active in the industry, so she thought that maybe it would be a good person to be connected with. We get there. He's ridiculously attractive, gorgeous, if you will, so charismatic. He was an actor. I think he'd been in a few things, and almost immediately, Shane became skeptical. He was like, who is this guy? And I'm like, why is he bothering you so much, Shane? He was four years older than me. Like, he traveled the world, you know, spoke a different language. He played a bunch of instruments. He was just so cocky and confident. And, well, of course, he, like, was bowling really well. And then here I am, like, can't even, like, knock five pins down. So it wasn't too long after we went bowling that we all got together again at my friend Lizzie's apartment. It was that night that we finally exchanged phone numbers. We ended up hanging out, you know, a few times here and there. It did not take long for me to really feel comfortable with Tom that I could tell him anything. Like, I trusted him with my life. It was incredible to finally experience that feeling of love. You, you know, like the butterflies, it's what I'd always imagined that all my friends felt like. It didn't take long for me to move into his apartment. They got very close very quickly. I think the freedom wasn't moving to LA. I think Tom was definitely the door for Shane to come to terms with himself. The more Tom and I fell in love, the more we wanted to tell our parents about it. But each of us had the philosophy that there was no need to tell your family until you found that person that you were going to spend the rest of your life with. So my mom and my aunt were visiting, and it was very late at night but I, I told my mom that I had to talk to her. With Tom by my side, I said, Mom? I said, honey, if you're gonna tell me you're gay, that's fine, I know it, and I'm with, okay with it. And I said, and is Tom your partner? And Tom goes, yep, I'm his partner. Tom was sitting there waiting for a big blow up or something, and I just said, well, great. I, you know, I don't have to worry about Shane like I did. Tom was my godsend. Shane didn't have his anxieties anymore. He was um, more confident. He was happy. He was just more of a man. Just not roasting on an open fire. Tom and I knew it would be a challenge to come out to his parents. So he was in Indiana for Christmas. It was just him and his mom. And there was something that came on TV about a lesbian couple. And Tom's mom made a comment about how that was disgusting. And Tom, at that moment, just realized, like, I need to tell her. He told his mom, Mom, I'm gay. Like, when you say things like that, you're talking about me. He was, I think, sort of building on what had happened when Shane came out. Shane had come out to his mother, and she basically filled in the blanks. Oh, you're gay. I knew that. I always knew that. I was sure that his mom knew that he was gay, but she immediately called his dad to, to come home from work because of this breaking news. And she went on and on about how it was a sin and that Tom should have told them sooner so he could have gotten medical help. His dad said a lot of hateful things towards him and, and blamed Shane for making him gay. It's Shane's fault. Shane turned you gay. Um, being in LA turned you gay all of your accomplishments so far being nothing now. They said, change your mind, you have to change your mind. And Tom said that he just kept saying, no, like, I, you know, I can't change my mind. It's not a, a mind change thing. Tom called me. He told me that his dad pulled a shotgun on him. And at that point, I, I was really scared. So while Tom and I were on the phone, his dad, Norman, literally ripped the door off the hinges and his mom got on the phone and she said to me, listen here, fucker, 
um, I don't know what you did to our son, but we're going to come to L.A. We're going to find you. I think the phrase his dad used was, he was going to come out to California and gut him. When the police showed up at the house, Tom's dad just kind of poo-pooed it off. He said, ah, you know how these California kids are. Those phone calls for those next two days until Tom got out of there were just, I, my heart just broke for both those boys. It was, it was just so scary and so sad. So that next morning, Tom's parents were in the kitchen with the Bible on the table. Out loud, they were saying the verses almost in a way just to justify that the day before, they beat up their son because he was gay. He's like, I can't believe this. I just got attacked and told that I should have taken the fact that I'm gay to the grave. Merry Christmas. It was just an awful situation, and Tom, you know, got out of there as soon as he could and flew back to California. To you. So eventually Martha made her way out to California, and I was really, really nervous. This was like the first time that I was going to see Martha since that you know, horrible experience. I think Martha came here because she did not want to lose her son. So she had to embrace Shane and act like she accepted the relationship. It was a little awkward for a while, but eventually, you know, we warmed up to each other. We would go to dinner. Tom and her would laugh, like, hysterically. When they get together, it's like two little old ladies. And although she didn't say, like, you know, Shane, I'm sorry, or Tom, I'm sorry for, you know, how we handled everything, it was still just, to us, it was like, this is her way of showing that she's accepting us. She has this picture where they went to, to Grumman's Theater and saw Elvis's handprints. She said that was the happiest day of her life. I think she truly enjoyed coming out to California. And then she would get back to Indiana and basically wouldn't acknowledge Tom's life here. And, you know, again, it was kind of like just baby steps. Truly, after like, you know, a few times, we felt like, you know, she was okay with us and she was happy for us. Yeah, I guess one of the saddest parts when I really think about Shane and Tom is the fact that essentially they're living the American dream with the exception of being able to get married to each other. Everyone like brings up domestic partnership and and it, it angers me in a way because no little girl is sitting in a room and saying that I can't wait to have a domestic partnership. I can't wait to wear a white dress during my domestic partnership. That's not something that that people dream about. They dream about getting married. And they weren't allowed to do that. And if it is ever illegal, they'll never be able to experience it because he's not here anymore. The thing that haunts me now is we had a fight that morning. Originally, we were supposed to hang out with our friend Alex and go take photographs together. And after our little argument, I decided that I would just stay home. Tom and I decided to meet at the studio, and we kept going back and forth. And he's like, let's go to your place. I, I just remember the sunlight in the kitchen. I, I need some of that sunlight now. And I was like, OK. He was like, no, I want to do something good for you. Let's do a photo shoot. It had turned this day around. So I had just started dating this man, and it was his birthday, and it, we, I wasn't with him. So Tom was like, I want to make him jealous. So let's put pictures of you on Facebook. And he was the one that was like, let's do it, let's do it. Hey, can I do your hair? I was like, um, OK. Yeah. And I have, you know, my brazier filled with socks, because, you know, there's just not much there. So Tom and I were texting throughout the day, and we eventually made up. It wasn't even a discussion whether or not to go to the roof because we always went to the roof. And we told each other that we love each other. And I'm so thankful that we did because I have that forever now. And so by the time we get up to the roof, um, Tom has his camera, he's all ready. We'd all been up there like 50 times. And every time I'm just paranoid because it's not like a, a tall wall, it's a short wall. He just playing around with the camera. And meanwhile, I know that he had just been texting with Shane. I told him to stay away from the edge, because we all know that he's a klutz. And he even wrote back, he was like, ha ha, I will. Like, I was joking. And I, I said, Tom, I'm serious. Like, stay away from the edge. So he, um, he takes a bunch of pictures. But I'm trying to be as slutty and as, you know, not sexy, because it wasn't sexy. <laughs> Um, I'm in one corner, and then we suddenly switch. And um, he's like, I've got it, I've got it. So he takes like three or four steps back. I 
I don't think we registered that he was gonna fall. He was like, oh, and I was like, oh. You know, and I, and I looked at him and it was like, we both thought, oh no, Shane's gonna be so mad. You know, just like, you know, if he knew that we were that close. And then after that, it was a nightmare. I, um, I didn't even go look over the edge, so I just like tore my shoes off, ran downstairs, I had my phone in my back pocket, and I dialed 911, but I couldn't hear. So I just gave it to somebody out in the hallway because people heard him. I received a text from Alex to tell me that Tom had fallen. And I, I thought it was a joke. There's no way this is real. So I texted her back and I said, that's not funny. And then I didn't hear back from her. And so then I called Tom's phone and no one picked up. So at that moment is when like my heart just started racing. And by the time I get there, he's on you know, his stomach and I'm rubbing his back. I'm saying, it's okay, Tommy, it's okay, Tommy. Meanwhile, I look like a total hooker. Um, but it takes forever for the ambulance to get there. I want to say 25 minutes later, they were like, do you have his ID? Do you have his ID? I was like, what the fuck does it matter? Just get him on the ambulance. So I got to the ER, and they took me into a room where Alex was, and she was hysterical. When I first saw Shane, I said, I wish you were me. <sighs> I said, because you two have each other and the love you have is so strong, I wish it had been me, fellow. I asked her, you know, well, what's happening? Are they working on him? I, I didn't know anything. She didn't know anything. We hugged, you know, and we said we, we loved each other. And, um, you know, we're still hanging on to hope that he was okay. I tried calling Shane and I couldn't get through to him. And um, finally, he calls me back. He said, Mom, Tom was doing a photo shoot, and he fell off the roof. And I just, oh my god. I said, honey, just keep on praying. He'll be fine. You know, we'll get the prayers going here. So a little bit later, he calls me, and, and he says, Mom, they, they won't let me in to see him. And I said, well, how come? And they said, because I'm not family. And I just, oh my god, Shane. So I called Tom's mom, and it's, you know, late at night in Indiana. and. Uh, you know, the first thing she says was, well, how much was he drinking, Shane? And, um, and then his dad in the background said, well, what the hell was he doing on the roof? And I just, but from that point forward, I made sure to let the nursing staff or the doctors speak to her and to him. And it had been probably about an hour later, the, the doctor came into the room and like, I just, I knew. I knew what he was going to say and when he when he was talking like it just it wasn't registering in my head like I wasn't processing what he said he just said he didn't make it I mean it was very you know and um, we all just lost it well, I had to just leave the room so I went outside I called my mom and And I was like, Mom, like, he died. And, you know, she just said, like, I'm so sorry, Shane. Like, I'm so sorry. And he's just crying, and I'm crying. And, you know, here you are, again, 1,500 miles away, and you can't be there for your child. I figured Shane was probably there when he passed, by his bed, holding his hand. And he said no. So I went to the nurse's station, and I said, you know, my friend's boyfriend is here. He just passed away. Can you take him back? And she said, we can't allow non-family members to see him until his parents arrive. So I kept trying to argue with this nurse. And the lady was like, I understand, honey, I do, but it's against the hospital rules. He's not his family. I said, but he is his family. They have a house together. They have a business together. They have a dog together. They've been together for six years. Finally, we were sitting in a room, and this one nurse opened the door, and she said, is Shane in here? And so we went outside. She was holding Tom's license, and she said, man, he was a good-looking guy. Jeez, I mean, all the nurses back here are talking about how handsome he was, and we've been working back here to try to kind of make him look the way that you remember him. Come with me, and we're going to take you back. 
I think at the end of the day, the nurses knew, you know, it's not a gay thing, it's not a straight thing, it's a human thing, but it was definitely a, a gift, I think, that those women gave to Shane. So they walked me back to his room. There was tubes all over his body, tubes coming out of his chest. His face was covered, but you could see that there, you know, had been blood like all around his face. And it didn't really seem like this was happening. I just stood there for a while. I didn't know what to do. The only place that I could put my hand was like on his leg. And I did, you know, one final tap, tap, tap. to his death from a four-story apartment building in Los Feliz last night. Police say he was taking pictures of a woman. They don't suspect foul play and are calling his death a tragic accident. So I picked Martha up from the airport and we went to our house. She wanted to talk about bank accounts, all these things that I, I did not want to talk about. She wanted to go through all the Shane and Tom's clothes. He let her go through all the drawers. She tried to take the computers. That was Shane and Tom's. It's just like Shane didn't exist anymore. Shane was more than willing to work with her, give her anything she wanted of Tom's, but it, it, it started to invade his privacy, and he wouldn't say anything. Martha would make a comment about something, and Shane would just stuff the emotions away, like back when kids would call him names. We started talking about the funeral, and she said that, you know, we're all invited, we're, we can stay at their house, you know, come as a family, we'll, we'll just do all this together. And then as the days go on, she pretty much quit talking about the funeral and about us all going and, and sharing, you know, Tom with everybody back east. Tom's mom was in the other room or even sometimes right next to me making the funeral arrangements and planning it all out. And I, I was not a part of it. It was like I wasn't there. It was like I was a ghost. And then that Thursday morning, Martha's like, I got to go. And Shane's like, I'll drive you to the airport. She's like, no, I'll get a taxi. I told her, like, I'm not going to let you take a taxi. I, I kind of had a, a feeling that she knew something that I didn't know, that she knew that his body was going to be released any moment. She was packing all Tom's clothes up that she was going to bury him in, and the jacket that she wanted to put him in was not fitting in the suitcase. And Shane's like, it's OK, Martha, I'll just bring it. And she's like, no, absolutely not. So maybe looking back now, it could have been foreshadowing what could have happened, that she knew then that she wasn't going to let Shane come to the funeral. I dropped her off, and we hugged. And I asked her to please keep me updated so I know what's happening. And she promised me that she would. But I never heard from her again. So although I never heard from Martha, my mom and Alex and I, we all booked our plane tickets. During a layover, I received a phone call from one of Tom's relatives. And she wanted to let me know that I wasn't welcome to attend his funeral. Because if I do show up, his uncle and his father had planned an attack. And she wanted me to know that it's for my own safety that I don't go. All I could think of is, are they going to shoot him? Are they going to kill my son? When we got 
into Indiana, one of Tom's best friends picked us up and Alex was hysterical. And the closer we got to Knox, the, the more hysterical she got. And she was saying, I lost Tom, I don't want to lose you also. I was terrified that they were going to come and put out a gun on Shane. And I remember him saying more than once, you know, they're in a lot of pain. It's not just me that's going through this and almost arguing for them, which was maddening. I mean, I'd be angry. You're not going to do this to me. Nope, he didn't respond that way. We had a secret relocation to kind of come up with a plan about, you know, just kind of staying out of their way. And even though I couldn't be in the church, like I wanted to be as close as I could to Tom, just being near was somehow comforting. Once I realized that Shane had been banned from attending the funeral, I realized that's why they weren't telling anybody when things were. They basically were keeping all the information close hold so that Shane couldn't get there. In the blink of an eye, everything has changed. There were probably 800 people there. Half of them were there to support Tom, and the other half were there to support Martha. If I could have one more day, I'd spend it all with you. The casket was in the middle, and it was draped with a Culver blanket and all of his Culver accomplishments, and, and his mom was wearing his Culver ring. But I think it was very reflective of the family and how they viewed Tom, and not the Tom that I knew. When I got out to Martha, all I could think in my head was, I have to kiss the casket for Shane. I took the flowers from the bouquet that the class of 2000 sent, and I dried them so I could give those to Shane. And I saved him a program because, you know, he's the love of Tom's life. He at least deserves that. Unfortunately, he wasn't mentioned in it. Families for literally 30 years can sweep that secret under the rug until someone dies. And then you have to really face the music. And I think that's what happened to Tom's parents. They had this great child. He was smart and talented, lots of positive things. But the one positive thing that they, they didn't want to brag to their friends about is that Tom had an amazing partner because they were ashamed. And so what they did is they literally erased it from the history books by shutting down his Facebook page, by disinviting Shane to the funeral. They're not even mentioning him there, which is the most insulting thing anyone could ever do to a person's memory. They're not fighting against gay marriage. They're not fighting against having a gay son. What they're fighting against is love. And who fights against love? I, I stayed with Shane after Tom passed away for a month. I told Shane, I'll stay here as long as you need me. But getting on that plane was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. You know, I, you don't want to leave him because he was fragile. Hey, Tom. Um, this is happening. Is this really happening? To all those people that um, say that gay people are unable to love. And I ask every single husband and wife that is in love to just to just feel what I'm feeling. Even, even for 10 minutes and um, but really I, I don't wish this upon anybody. I don't. I finally brought you your ring. <laughs> I'm sorry that I didn't, I didn't get you one sooner. I put tap, tap, tap inside, um. You know, there's a part of me that thinks maybe I should tell someone or maybe I should show someone, you know, how I'm really feeling instead of just telling everyone I'm okay. Happy birthday to you. A few months later, 
I went back to Indiana. I felt like I just needed to see Tom's grave one more time. When I got to the cemetery, I was surprised to see that Tom's parents had bought him a monument with a place for themselves, not next to each other, but on either side of their son. As though they're still trying to keep him from something or someone. It's just, it's hard to believe that even now, Tom is still being denied the promise of his own name. It really does feel like he's standing in for all of us now. I mean, like, for all gay people who dream of getting married someday. I guess I'll never understand why the ones who are supposed to love him the most fight the hardest to keep him from being who he was. Maybe the greatest thing about Tom is how much he loved them anyway. I just remember standing there and thinking, if there's one thing that I could say to his parents, here's what it would be. This is not the monument to your son. He was the monument to you. that I was gay because I could draw my uncle was and I kept my room straight I told my mom tears rushing down my face she's like Ben you've loved girls since before pre-k hey. again I just want to say thank you um, so much for for taking the time to be here and you know, for just giving me the chance to share my story what happened is the year after Tom passed away was by far the most difficult period of my life and you know for a year I just really struggled with trying to make sense of everything and, and trying to just come up with reasons as to why I should even continue living and as the anniversary of his death was approaching there was something inside of me that knew I had to do something and you know I, I just felt this need to finally like stand up for myself and you know, and speak out and, and try to prevent what happened to me from happening to someone else. And so I put together a, a 10 minute video that I posted on YouTube and I posted it on the first anniversary and it unexpectedly went viral and was, it was shared all over the world and it passed like 2 million views in less than 48 hours, which was crazy because the video was like 10 and a half minutes long, which on the internet, that's like an eternity. <laughs> um, but it was amazing just to see the reaction that, you know, I was not alone. There's lots of people who unfortunately had been through something similar. And about, about a month after the video went viral is when I was contacted by a director. Uh, her name is Linda Budworth Thomason. She is the creator of Designing Women. I don't know if you guys know that show. And, you know, I, I met with her and she said that she wanted to reach even more people with the story and she believed it could open hearts and minds and she asked me if I wanted to make a documentary and uh, you know my first reaction was like this is scary I don't you know I don't know if I should do this but then you know I looked at what was happening with the YouTube video and I saw the positive reaction and I kind of felt like I have to do this and she shared a story with me about her mom who passed away from AIDS uh, she was a victim of transfused AIDS um, and she told me about how she was in the hospital in Los Angeles and how the nurses wouldn't even go into her mom's room, that they would put her pills in a bucket and kick the bucket into her room. And one time she even heard nurses in the hallway talking and uh, one nurse said that if there's one good thing that this disease has going for it is that it's killing all the right people. And when she shared that story with me, I kind of felt like this is the perfect person to tell my story, that this wasn't just a, a director trying to make a political statement. And we, we ended up launching a Kickstarter campaign and we became the most funded film project in the history of the website at the time. And the film premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival where uh, President Clinton uh, introduced it. He saw a rough cut of the film and he asked if he could introduce it, which was crazy. 
I'm like, what is happening? And, and then it went on to win the Audience Award um, at pretty much every film festival that we were in. And then it somehow got into the hands of Oprah Winfrey, who she asked if she could premiere it on her network. And so that's where we premiered it. And the same day, it also appeared on Netflix. And, and so I've just been, since then, that was in 2013, I've just been traveling the world and, and screening the film and sharing my story. And I was approached eventually to, you know, to travel and speak at universities. And my instinct was to say, no, I'm like, I can't. <laughs> I can't get up in front of people. I can't do this. But you know, I'm, I'm glad that, that I did. And, and I just saw it as an opportunity to you know, face my fears. And I feel like this is it's bigger than me. And it's, it's kind of crazy that you know, here I am you know, five years after his passing, and I'm still traveling and sharing my experience and you know, there's a lot of people who they don't think this is healthy they don't think that I should continue to to speak about it but then when I you know I travel and I go to schools and young people come up to me and they say that the film gives them hope or just from sharing my story that it makes them rethink suicide you know I'm like how can I not keep doing this and so, again, when I, when I say it, just thank you for being here, it, it honestly, it really, it does mean so much. And I don't know how long this stuff will happen, but, um, you know, it's, just, it's these experiences that I will remember forever. And again, just thank you for, for making this possible. Hopefully I turn this on. Um, but I, I feel compelled on behalf of everyone in here just to hug you really quick. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you. <laughs> I saw, I was one of the however many people who went viral, the YouTube video, because I just remember vividly sitting on my bed and sobbing like a baby. <laughs> and then sitting Sorry. everybody I knew was looking like, you have to watch this because you're going to cry. And I think I probably sent it to a few of you here, so um, he's finally here. <laughs> um, but if anybody has questions, we're going to do Q and A. So just raise your hand, and uh, let's go now get to the microphones. In the five years since Tom's death, have you seen things change or people shift? Is anything easier for you now? It seems so hard for so long. Um. I mean, things have definitely changed. The, the film kind of became like a tool to you know, advocate for marriage equality. And you know, as we know, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of that, which is amazing. Um, and just even going back home to Montana and talking to high school students, they've said you know, it's, it's changed there. And there's students who are out, and they're not being bullied. And, and so in so many ways, as you know, we've seen the change, and it's, it's great, but in the past, six months especially um you know it seems like we're kind of going back in time um and so i kind of feel like now more than ever you know we just have to speak out about this stuff and um you know a lot of people don't realize that you can still be fired in most states for being gay and you know 40 percent of homeless youth identify as lgbt and so we still have a you know a long ways a long ways to go I don't have a question per se, but first of all, I just want to say thank you. What a tribute. And you have made a difference. Oh, thank and you. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Hi. Hi. Thank you for sharing um, Tom with us and joining the two of us together. Since the making of the film, I mean, it's interesting when, when we decided to make the film. I, you know, I kind of felt like his family has to participate because if they don't, then who's going to take the film seriously? Uh, but what you didn't see is at the end, it says that we reached out to his family uh, multiple times, but they never responded. And I kind of, you know, just felt like that speaks volumes. 
Uh, we sent a copy of the film to his parents. I'm not sure if they've, they've watched it, but to this day, I haven't heard from his parents. Um, I've become friends with his sister and nieces and nephew who support me and support the film, and that also makes it a lot easier for me to keep doing this, knowing that even his own relatives support it. Um, but, you know, I, I don't, I feel like at this point, I don't think I'll ever hear from his parents. And I, I, you know, I just imagine that if, if they don't acknowledge it, then it's not really happening. And so it kind of just seems like that's the approach that they're going to probably continue to take. Yeah. One thing I was going to say, too, is uh, my grandmas, which are in the film, uh, <laughs> they're amazing. And I'm just so grateful that my family participated, and especially my, you know, at that time it was 92-year-old great-grandma Pat. Um, you know, she didn't even hesitate. She was like, yes, I'll do this. And unfortunately, she just passed away about six months ago. And her, they had her memorial service just a, a few weeks ago. But you know, I'd like to just acknowledge them and, and just say thank you to, to her out loud because it, it sends a powerful statement just to see that you know, here's this lady who lives in a town of 200 people who's 90 plus years old, and she supported me. And I think that that you know, says a lot. So. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing it with them. And, you know, I, I think that it can be easy, especially living in Los Angeles, to kind of, you know, be in a bubble and not realize what it's like in other places, um, you know, where a lot of young people, you know, don't necessarily understand how that could happen. But honestly, it's, it's moms like you that are so accepting and that are willing to introduce them to, you know, people who are different that, I mean, it has the power to, to change the world, as you know, cheesy as that sounds, because there are many moms out there who don't accept their children, and I, I meet young people every week who their parents don't even talk to them. And with that being said, I just yeah, thank you for, for being an amazing mom. Yeah. I think for me, I think it would have made me uncomfortable if my mom, you know, like brought it up and I would have denied it. But I think that, you know, it can be very, you know, powerful just for a parent to kind of throw in like little comments here and there to, to make it clear that they are accepting and that if, 
their child happened to be that way that you would be fine with it. Because I've, yeah, I've, I've heard from you know, a lot of young people whose parents kind of encourage them to, to come out of the closet when they just, they weren't ready. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things you kind of, you know, you have to, to know within if you're ready or not. And, um, and at the same time, you know, I tell a lot of young people who, you know, are scared of coming out and I tell them just to be patient with their families. Because I think sometimes, you know, when you're ready to come out, you're like, okay, this is who I am, like embrace it. But you know, as we know, there's a lot of parents or other family members who just have a different mentality and it takes some time to adapt to that change. And so I you know, encourage patience in that aspect. Um, but yeah, I, like I said, I just think that, you know, you kind of have to give them the space and, and make it clear without forcing them to, to speak about it. Not that I'm, I'm clearly no expert, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, I don't know what I just said, but hopefully that, that works out. So, thank you. That is how I handled it. Oh, okay. Was if I had an opportunity, if I saw something on TV, I would let him know I was accepting to that idea just so that he knew that there was love in the home for him mm-hmm. no matter what. All right. Wow. There was, I received an email from some parents who, they, they knew that their son was probably gay, but they didn't ever make it clear that they were that accepting of it and that the, their son ended up taking his own life um, and leaving note that he was so afraid of their reaction. And so it's, you know, it's like this fine line. Um, and so it's, you know, just it's a, it's a tough situation. Do we have any other questions? I don't want to end on that sad note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, sorry. If you don't, I just, um, and you tell me so can you say what, about your happiness right now. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, I follow this, like I said, I follow Chase's story very closely and friend of on Facebook. Um, and so <laughs> I was, you know, it, I, like I said, I shared the video with so many people. And then um, it was New Year's Eve, was it last year? Uh, 2015. Yeah. 2015. Okay, so New Year's Day, you know, I go on my Facebook and I'm looking, and there's this wonderful photo of him who I also adore because he was one of my favorite contestants on American Idol, um, <laughs> Raymond Owen. And so um, he has got happiness again, I think, right? Love again? Which... Yeah, I mean, you know, for so long I just I couldn't even comprehend the idea of just dating. And, you know, I just had to, you know, allow myself time and just trust that if it's meant to be, it, it will happen. And, and just unexpectedly I ended up meeting someone who he's... It's just like amazing because I feel like for someone to come into this situation with, I mean, I have a lot of baggage, let's, you know, let's be real, um, that he has not once made me feel like I can't, you know, embrace this part of my life and, and he encourages me to keep traveling and sharing my story and um, I'm just so fortunate to, to have met him. Yeah. It just feels good to know that he has, he's happy. I mean, because I know you watch this, and, and like, I mean, it feels like really real for me right now. And I know <laughs> that it's, you know, it's been several years for you, but it just makes me feel good to know that he is, he has found happiness. Yeah, so thank we you. thank you so much for oh, being here thank today. Thank you. Um, and all of you.